Hello everyone. Um, Gordon asked me to share something to encourage us all today. Um, so I thought I'd share about what God's been speaking to me this week, um, about how the joy of the Lord is our strength. You've probably heard that phrase a lot of times before. It comes from Nehemiah 8. Um, but the reason why I've been thinking and praying through that verse this week is because one of our friends, you will know Anne from King's Edinburgh, um, sent a couple of us this verse from Habakkuk. It's Habakkuk 3 verse 17 to 19 and in the message it says, Though the cherry trees don't blossom and the strawberries don't ripen, though the apples are worm-eaten and the wheat fields stunted, though the sheep pens are sheepless and the cattle barns empty, I'm singing joyful praise to God. I'm turning cartwheels of joy to my saviour God, counting on God's rule to prevail. I take heart and gain strength. I run like a deer. I feel like I'm king of the mountain. Um, and I know these days we don't depend so much on olive groves and strawberry plantations um, in the same way as they did before. Um, but I guess what this verse is saying is that in hard times, we must sing joyful praise to God. Um, and I guess for most of us, 2020 is a bit of a hard time. Um, and living in the second lockdown is a hard time. But I know that lots of people in the church are also struggling personally with physical health, with college applications, with work, with housing, with parenting, lots of things. And so I've been um, praying that we as a church would find our, our strength in the joy of the Lord. Um, and as I've been thinking of that, I just wanted to mention a couple of things about it. Um, first of all, the joy of the Lord is just that. It's from God. It's God's joy. It's not that we have to sort of well up some kind of positivity, some kind of resilience, some kind of false happiness when life is difficult. It's not that at all. It's God's joy. And we get to know God's joy and God give his joy to us. And the second thing is this. Um, the context of that verse in Nehemiah about the joy of the Lord being our strength is when the exiles were going back to Jerusalem and the book of law was being read out by Ezra, the man of God. And um, all the people were grieving and sorrowful because the law was exposing the fact that they hadn't lived God's way. And they were sorry for their sin and they were sorry that they didn't match God's standards and there was wailing and crying. And then the man of God said to them, don't do that, feast um, eat the fat, eat the fat of the land um, and have joy because the joy of the Lord is your strength. And what he was saying was that God took joy in them coming back to him. God took joy in them connecting with him. He knew they weren't perfect. He knew they weren't living up to his standards, but his joy was in relationship with them. And it's the same for us, that God takes joy in us connecting with him. So this is my encouragement today, that when we're going through hard times, connect with God and his joy in us doing that is our strength. Let's do that today. Well, guys, welcome to our online service. It's so good to have you with us, uh, particularly if you weren't able to make the live gathering yesterday. Um, I just want to say, if you're a part of Kings, I just want you to know uh, that we love you. We are praying for you. If you're not, for whatever reason, able to connect uh, live on Zoom, you're not forgotten. Uh, you're such a part of this church. And yeah, just hopefully want to offer some encouragement to you that you're not forgotten. And you know, there's a day coming when we're going to gather again uh, in person, which we are so looking forward to. Uh, the date is the 8th of November. So make sure that date's in your diary. 8th of November, we're going to be back at the Lanthorn uh, for our first live gathering. We literally cannot wait. Um, there's other things that you can look forward to. Uh, 25th of October, we've got Terry Virgo speaking to us as a church. He'll be preaching to us on Sunday. Um, Terry, Terry Virgo uh, founded New Frontiers, which is the network of churches we're a part of. 
And actually, just to say, he, he's producing daily devotionals, uh, just a few minutes long, and they are so good. Would so recommend them to you. Uh, this week, he did a series uh, on sort of spiritual depression and how to cope when you're just a bit down in the dumps, which I know for lots of us is the reality of this season. So, yeah, I would encourage you to look those out on Facebook or YouTube. Search for Terry Virgo and you'll find those. Another resource you can access, uh, Lou Fellingham. Uh, she's a worship leader, used to be part of a band called Fat Fish. Every Wednesday morning, 8.30, uh, her and her husband, Nathan, produce uh, a worship session live on Facebook and YouTube again. Again, that's a great resource you can access. Uh, what else is happening? Messy Church happened this morning. So if you have kids, primary school age, uh, again, look on our website, look on Facebook, look on YouTube. You'll find the Messy Church video. Uh, it was all about lions, uh, Daniel and the lion's den. They even had some real lions in it. Mike was preaching from the zoo. So it's well worth a watch if you've got kids. Uh, and then final thing, just to uh, recommend, uh, I was given this book this week uh, by Jeanette uh, called Where is God in the Coronavirus World? Uh, I love books that are, are tiny uh, because if you know me, I'm not a, not a great reader. Uh, but would really recommend it to you. It's by John Lennox, Where is God in the Coronavirus World? And just grapples with the questions of, God, what is going on? Why is this happening? How do we process it as Christians? What's our kind of understanding of coronavirus and, and what's happening and where it's come from? Yeah, really helpful book. Uh, I think it's two quid on Amazon, uh, worth looking up. Well, guys, we're going to go to our preach. Uh, Kristen is going to read our scripture, which is Daniel 4, and then Luke's going to be preaching to us. Uh, and like I say, can't wait to see you on the 8th of November in person. And God bless. Love you guys. And we'll see you soon. Yeah, okay, great. Okay. So this is Daniel 4. So it's a fairly long one. So settle in. Okay. So King Nebuchadnezzar's dream of a tree. King Nebuchadnezzar, to the nations and people of every language who live in all the earth, may you prosper greatly. It is my pleasure to tell you about the miraculous signs and wonders that the Most High God has performed for me. How great are his signs, how mighty his wonders. His kingdom is an eternal kingdom. His dominion endures from generation to generation. I, Nebuchadnezzar, was at home in my palace and prosperous. I had a dream that made me afraid. As I was lying in bed, the images and visions that passed through my mind terrified me. So I commanded that all the wise men of Babylon be brought before me to interpret the dream for me. When the magicians, enchanters, astrologers, and diviners came, I told them the dream, but they could not interpret it for me. Finally, Daniel came into my presence, and I told him the dream. He is called Balthazar, after the name of my God and the spirit of the holy God is in him. I said, Balthazar, chief of the magicians, I know that the spirit of the holy gods is in you, and no mystery is too difficult for you. Here is my dream. Interpret it for me. These are the visions I saw while lying in bed. I looked, and there before me stood a tree in the middle of the land. Its height was enormous. The tree grew large and strong, and its top touched the sky. It was visible to the ends of the earth. Its leaves were beautiful, its fruit abundant, and on it was food for all. Under it, the wild animals found shelter, and the birds lived in its branches. From it, every creature was fed. In the visions I saw while lying in bed, I looked, and there before me was a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven. He called in a loud voice, cut down the tree and trim off its branches. Strip off its leaves and scatter its fruit. Let the ants flee from under it and the birds from its branches, but let the stump and its roots bound with iron and bronze remain in the ground, in the grass of the field. Let him be drenched with the, do with the dew of dawn and of heaven and let him live with the animals among the plants of the earth. Let his mind be changed from that of a man and let him be given to the mind of an animal to seven times pass by for him. The decision is announced by messengers. The holy ones declare the verdict so that the living may know that the most high is sovereign over all kingdoms on, our, on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes and sets over them the lowliest of people. This is the dream that I, King Nebuchadnezzar, had. Now, Balthazar, tell me what it means, for none of the wise men in my kingdom can interpret it for me, but you can, because the spirit of the holy gods is in you. Then Daniel, also called Balthazar, was greatly perplexed for a time, and his thoughts terrified him. So the king said, do not let me dream, do not let the dream or its meaning alarm you. Balthazar answered, My lord, if only the dream applied to your enemies and its meaning to your adversaries. The tree you saw, which grew large and strong with its top touching the sky, with beautiful leaves and abundant fruit, providing fruit for all, giving shelter to the wild animals, and having nesting places in its branches for the birds. Your majesty, you are that tree. 
You have become great and strong. Your greatness has grown until it reaches the sky and your domain extends to distant parts of the earth. Your majesty saw a holy one, a messenger coming down from heaven and saying, cut down the tree and destroy it, but leave the stump bound with iron and bronze in the grass of the field. While its roots may remain in the ground, let him be drenched with the dew of heaven. Let him live with wild animals until seven times pass by for him. This is the interpretation, your majesty, and this is the decree the Most High has issued against my lord, the king. You will be driven away from you and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox and be drenched with the dew of heaven. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the most sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. The command to leave the stump of the tree with its roots means that your kingdom will be restored to you when you acknowledge that heaven rules. Therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice. Renounce your sins by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the pressed. It may be that then your prosperity will continue. All this happened to King Nebuchadnezzar. The dream is fulfilled. Twelve months later, as the king was walking on the roof of the royal palace of Babylon, he said, Is not this the great Babylon I have built as the royal residence by my mighty power and for the glory of my majesty? Even as the words were on his lips, a voice came from heaven. This is what I decreed for you, King Nebuchadnezzar. Your royal authority has been taken from you. You will be driven away from people and will live with the wild animals. You will eat grass like the ox. Seven times will pass by for you until you acknowledge that the Most High is sovereign over all kingdoms on earth and gives them to anyone he wishes. Immediately, what had been said about Nebuchadnezzar was fulfilled. He was driven away from people and ate grass like the ox. His body was drenched with the dew of heaven until his hair grew like the feathers of an eagle and his nails like the claws of a bird. At the end of time, at the end of the time, I, Nebuchadnezzar, raised my eyes to heaven and my sanity was restored. Then I praised the Most High. I honored and glorified him who lives forever. His, his dominion is an eternal dominion. His kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the peoples of the earth are regarded as nothing. He does as he pleases with the powers of heaven and the peoples of the earth. No one can hold him back. No one can hold back his hand or say to him, what have you done? At the same time that my sanity was restored, my honor and splendor returned to me for the glory of my kingdom. My advisors and nobles sought me out and I was restored to my throne and became even greater than before. Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt the glory of the King of Heaven because everything he does is right and all his ways are just. And those who walk in pride, he is able to humble. There's a common phrase that says that pride comes before a fall. Basically, if you're too arrogant or self-important, something is bound to happen to you to make you look a fool. It'll all just catch up with you at some point. And it seems that this is just known to be the human experience. This is always what happens. And you may actually not, actually not know that this phrase comes or is inspired by the Bible. In Proverbs 16, 18, it says, Pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Not only is this the wisdom of God's word, it's actually the experience of King Nebuchadnezzar in the passage that we read today. And in it, this passage, Nebuchadnezzar recounts this vision that he's had and his experiences of reaching the heights of human um, glory, human power. His life was like the tree in the vision as it reached up to the sky, showing how great and strong and beautiful and abundant it was. Now, all of this prosperity and success might not have been a problem for the king if he had acknowledged the hand of God in all of it. After all, it is good for us to um, use our gifts and our abilities that are God-given to be a blessing to the world around us. However, there really was a big problem for Nebuchadnezzar, and it's one that we all face at different times. It was the issue of pride. Nebuchadnezzar was proud. We look at verse 30. Is not this the great Babylon that I have built as the royal residence? by my mighty power, 
and for the glory of my majesty. Pride comes before a fall. And this is what happens to Nebuchadnezzar. God gives him over to a, a time of humbling, seven years of insanity and the loss of all of this prestige, his honour and influence. But the king's conclusion at the end of all of these events is actually remarkable and it's wonderful. In verse 37 it says this, Now I, Nebuchadnezzar, praise and exalt and glorify the king of heaven, because everything he does is right and all his ways are just and those who walk in pride he is able to humble. Wow what a miraculous transformation. I wonder if you've ever had the experience of being humbled. For me something that springs to mind is from um, when I was a teenager and I used to being tall, I used to play for the school basketball team. To be honest, I wasn't very good at basketball, but as I say, I was tall. I stood out, so I was probably quite a good target. I could catch the ball, I could throw it. Um, but as a team, we thought we were pretty good. Um, and in fact, we did win a lot of matches. Uh, I'm not sure many other schools played basketball. We had a, a good coach, so we managed to beat a few rubbish teams and uh, eventually we actually became the sort of the champions of our area of the northeast um, of the various schools. So we were put into this competition um, uh, nationwide to see who uh, I guess would be the best school in the whole of the, of, the, of the UK and we had to go along to this next stage to see who was the best northern team. So we just thought we were brilliant. We thought we were um, the greatest school basketball team probably to have existed. So um, we got on the minibus, we drove uh, two hours to get to Sheffield. And we, yeah, on the way, spirits are high, we think we're gonna win this game easy. But we turn up and straight away, you can tell this is a completely different kind of match. They're in this amazing, gym hall, they've got these proper strips, all the gear, the right trainers, and they, these guys are big. And as we started the game, we just you just knew from the first minute that we were going to be thrashed. And it really was a, a humbling. They use that phrase in sport a lot. When one team gets thrashed, especially if they've been riding on a crest of a wave, if they've been quite proud of their achievements and then they come crashing down. We, we were like that, we were humbled. And I have to say the spirits on the way home weren't quite as high as they were on the way there. And this is a, a fairly trivial example. The reality is that being humbled can be a really painful experience. And certainly for, the, for King Nebuchadnezzar, this was really painful. Seven years of acting like an animal, it said. And it's not something that we would ever really choose. It's not top of our priority list. But somehow God has designed the process of being humbled to bring about amazing transformation in our lives. In short, he's looking for us to become humble people. Jonathan Edwards, the 18th century American preacher, said this. We must view humility as one of the most essential things that characterises true Christianity. As a Christian, humility is not an optional extra. Being humbled and growing in humility are part and parcel of walking with God. So what is humility? Well, simply put, humility is having a right view of ourselves before God and before others. And the Bible speaks so highly of humility. I can't emphasise enough as I've been reading different scriptures, just seeing how God has put this as such a priority for, for Christians, for our, our walk with God and our, our lives before other people. 
And today I just want to do a, a really quick tour of some of the key scriptures to explore what, what God says about humility. And hopefully it'll help us to just to see how we can live humbly in our everyday lives. And I want to look at two things. So number one, the basis for humility. What is the, the root of it? Why? Why is it important? So the basis of humility and uh, number two, the blessings of humility. And I see both of these things in scripture. So let's kick off with the basis for humility. So why is pride bad and why is humility good? We, we don't necessarily see that around us in our time, in our culture. So our media, if we do a job, if we have friends and family, they're not necessarily saying that pride is that bad and that humility is this thing to be prized and to be lifted up. Um, and when I'm talking about pride, I'm talking about a certain kind of pride. So in, in, the, in Daniel 5 uh, verse 20, it talks again about King Nebuchadnezzar in his pride and it says this, when his heart became arrogant and hardened with pride, he was deposed from his royal throne and stripped of his glory. So the pride that we're speaking about today is this thing of an arrogant and hard heartedness. And like I say, that's our culture doesn't necessarily see that as a, a really bad thing. So we must look to the Bible for, for truth, for our anchor on this issue. And one of the things that the Bible teaches about humility, that it is based in the greatness of God. Isaiah 66 says this, Thus says the Lord, Heaven is my throne, and the earth is my footstool. All these things my hand has made, and so all these things came to be. But this is the one to whom I look, he who is humble and contrite in spirit, and trembles at my word. There's definitely a link between acknowledging the greatness of God and worshipping his splendour and our hearts being diverted away from pride and towards humility. As we've been thinking about Nebuchadnezzar, you can imagine that he really thought his achievements were actually up there with God, up there with the gods that he worshipped. Uh, he, he could imagine that he was rivaling the gods for, his, for greatness. But in um, Isaiah 55, God is speaking through the prophet and it's this amazing passage. He says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Humility finds its basis, its root in acknowledging the greatness of God. But what does this mean for us, for you and for me? Well, firstly, I think it means thinking less of ourselves and thinking more of God. And this might be in terms of time. How much time do I spend thinking about myself as opposed to thinking about God? But it might also be in terms of importance. How much weight do I give to my opinions about things compared to God's opinion? And certainly it must affect our achievements and how we view our achievements. This was Nebuchadnezzar's big issue. Would he see all that he built as his great achievement? In our lives, the achievements that we see are perhaps less obvious, but it must be true that we are all trying to build something whether it's a career or a family, whether it's our reputation, whether it's new skills, new hobbies, or even building a church. The question is, who are we doing it for? Who is actually responsible for the success of the things that we're involved in? And who deserves the glory? Is it for ourselves or is it for God? Another thing the Bible teaches uh, that humility is based in the example of Jesus. And there's 
this amazing passage in Philippians 2. It says this, Christ Jesus, who though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. This is the greatest ex example of humility that the world has ever seen. The Apostle Paul makes the point in this chapter that Christ's example should be the basis for our humility and lead us to live humble lives. In this chapter, he says things like this, count others as more significant than yourselves. Do nothing out of selfish ambition. Look to the interests of others. What does Christ's example mean for us, for our everyday lives? Well, let's take one of Paul's commands um, from Philippians 2 and let's think about how we can act on it in our daily lives. So he calls us as Christians to count others as more significant than ourselves. And as I'm speaking, just let God maybe pinpoint someone in your life that you could be a blessing to this week. Who is there that you could sacrifice some of your time or your energy to serve? And I, I know that this is happening already and amongst us and it brings our Father so much joy. But I also know that sin is pervasive. Sin gets in and, and we can just get comfortable looking out for ourselves more than looking to love others first. And for me, this verse, it challenges me to think about my, you know, my normal sort of busy day um, as a teacher. It's challenging me to think, well, who can I reach out to? Whether it's the children in my class or the colleagues around me, who can I say to, um, what can I do to help? What can I do to help? Is there anything you need done? Is there anything that you're, you're struggling with? Is there anything I can do just to, well, in my words, be a blessing? Now let's look at um, some of the blessings of humility. We've looked at the basis of it. Let's look at the blessings of humility. Earlier when we read um, verses from Isaiah 66, God seemed to be speaking through the prophet Isaiah about his heart for those who are humble. Again, it says this, but this is the one to whom I will look. He who is humble and contrite in spirit and trembles at my word. Other translations say, say that God looks on the humble with favour. And this theme is echoed throughout the Old and New Testaments. Proverbs 3, 34 says this about God, he, that he mocks proud mockers, but shows favour to the humble and oppressed. And this verse is actually repeated in both the books of James and 1 Peter, it really reinforcing this message. Peter actually follows this verse with um, words of his own, and he says, Humble yourselves, therefore, under God's mighty hand, that he may lift you up in due time. There's favour for the humble. God will lift up the humble. And Jesus taught this as well. We're going to look at Matthew 23, but there's other passages where Jesus is, is making this teaching so clear. Um, and in Matthew 23, the context is that he's speaking about this the teachers of the law, the religious kind of elites that are dominant and how they drifted so far from walking with God. And part of this for them was just slipping into pride. He said this about them. They do all their deeds to be seen by others. They love the place of honour. And he said that they loved being called rabbi by others almost being held in the, the highest of esteem was more important than actually teaching the people the truth and walking with God in humility. And in Matthew 23, he says, 
But you, to his disciples, you are not to be called rabbi, for you have one teacher and you are all brothers. And do not call anyone on earth father, for you have one father and he is in heaven. Nor are you to be called instructors, for you have one instructor, the Messiah. The greatest among you will be your servant, for those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. Those who humble themselves will be exalted. In one vivid example, Jesus responds to the misguided question of the disciples when they say, who is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven? And one commentator says about this question that the disciples just completely misunderstand greatness. They think of it in terms of human endeavour, accomplishment and status. And I'm, to be honest, I'm sure that we often slip into that too. Well, how does Jesus respond to our thoughts about greatness? And this is from Matthew 18. The disciples have asked the question and it says that Jesus called a little child to him and he placed the child among them and he said truly I tell you unless you change and become like little children you will never enter the kingdom of heaven therefore whoever takes the lowly position of this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven and whoever welcomes one such child in my name welcomes me the humility of a child consists of this childlike trust. It's about a vulnerability. It's about this kind of inability to do things by yourself, away from the, the help of a parent, away from their direction and their care and their resources and their support. But the promise for us, well, the promise for the humble is that whoever takes the lowly position of a child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. The promise is that those who humble themselves will be exalted. The promise is that God shows favour to the humble. These are the blessings of humility. And what does this mean for you and for me? When I think about these teachings of Jesus, one word um, springs to mind, and that word is rest. Yes, there is much to do in this life. For some of us, sometimes a week just flies by and the to-do list feels like it's just getting longer and longer. For others, as a, others of us, we feel restless that we're actually not doing enough, that we're not doing what we should be doing. Perhaps we're struggling with our kids Maybe family life is hectic. Perhaps we're looking for work. Perhaps we are working from home and just feeling a bit like we're not doing a great job of it. Or maybe we're just finding that relationships are not really flowing in the way that we'd want. There's not the harmony that we want that is actually discord. And there's always much to think about and much to do in life. But I think Jesus would speak his rest over us today. Life is not about racking up this long list of achievements. It's not about building a great reputation. At the end of the day, life is not about us. Life is about him. So let us have rest. Let us have rest from our striving. Let us humble ourselves before God. He will lift us up. He will give us all of the grace and favour that we need. Let's just rest in him.
Highest throne. 